Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, start by saying that I encourage everyone to stop me and ask questions uh, in the middle if you feel like it. Uh, so, be as informal uh, as possible. Um, so, we're n uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have uh, five lectures, uh, and how far we get depends on um, how much in depth we go into particular subjects, and that's up to you guys. So, uh, if there's one particular topic which you find interesting, we can continue on it, and I'll sort of gauge it by your responses from the lectures. Um, and the, so I'll, uh, I don't know how the other lecturers do it, but I was going to just uh, give the exercises here, just write them as I go along. And is that everybody, how, is that how everybody's been doing it? No. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, so, so I'll, I'll give the exercises, and so people can maybe work on them before they go to the afternoon sessions. And also, oh, so I sent Brando. Did he distribute that? The students have it. Okay. So the lectures there. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's uh, I I. So there should be two. So there should be two file, two PDF files that will cover the topics uh, discussed uh, in the last three lectures. The first two lectures I didn't have time to take up. The the so the, those files that I sent you are actually chapters from a book I'm writing, and I would really appreciate your feedback. Um, and please email me. I'm sure there are, it, uh, there are mistakes, typos, and everything. And it would be great if. Uh, if you um, just told me where they were. <laughs> <laughs> that way I don't have to find them. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to start off by giving a, a little sort of introduction to effective field theory and what I actually like to call uh, uh, radical effective field theoryism, uh, where we sort of take the, the essence of effective field theory and we push it as far as we can. So, um, so let me sort of motivate it by, uh, by, by going back to your um, <coughs> primary school days. Okay, so there's, there's, uh, the f there's something you're all familiar with. <coughs> and when you first learn this, uh, you know, eventually you get sophisticated and you say, well, you know, where does that come from? That just seems totally ad hoc, right? <laughs> Um, and then you get a little bit more sophisticated and you start to t you take classical mechanics and they say, oh, well, we can derive Newton's law. So how do we derive Newton's laws? Well, we define something called an action, which you write as the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And then we say we minimize the action using the minimization principle. We get the Euler-Lagrange equations and boom, out comes Newton's laws. Okay, so that's a better explanation, but it still really begs the, the question, this seems totally, where did you get this from? This T minus V thing, is, and so now every system I've got to calculate a V to figure out what the potential energy is for the system, and I've got to figure out what the T is, and I have to know what the right degrees of freedom are. So while it's better than F equals MA, it's still, in my opinion, not very satisfactory, and maybe we could push it a little bit further, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the bold claim that um, we can do much better than this um, just by using the basic tenets of effective field theory. So I'm going to uh, spend quite a bit of time deriving um, the action for a point particle, a free point particle. Um, and that will pay dividends because um, then we'll apply it to other systems and we'll see that the m methodology uh, is so powerful that it enables us to immediately write down uh, actions for all sorts of theories that had we started from this would have been incredibly painful, right? So, um, so for the moment, uh, let's, um, let's forget about, let's forget that this thing is even called an action. I'll keep writing it as S. But, and we'll still use the term action, but you can forget that it's T minus V or anything like that. So, um, I have to, uh, so I have to have some assumptions, right? So the question is what assumptions are reasonable and what assumptions are acceptable? 
Um, so if we have some physical system and we want to determine its equations of motion, so by the way, so everything I'm going to do all week is going to be completely classical, okay? This is all classical physics. And uh, in the last three lectures, I'll show you why this is uh, how we apply this to uh, black hole in spirals, okay, which is relevant to LIGO. So it won't be completely pedantic. And by the time we get to the end, then you'll have some idea of like what the cutting edge calculations are uh, for black hole in spirals. Okay, so um, so we're gonna we're going to um, jettison this t minus v thing. But one assumption we are going to continue to make is is that the equations of motion follow from some extremization procedure, right? So we're going to say there exists something. We'll call it an action, which extremize when extremize gives you the equations of motion, and that's a reasonable thing to believe. Um, you could, uh, if you wanted to, you could derive this from quantum mechanics, and you could say. Well, we know from quantum mechanics that there's a probability for a particle to traverse various paths. And um, if I look at some probability distribution, it's peaked at some point. So this is P of X and T. And um, this, uh, this probability distribution is peaked when I extremize something, we'll call it the action. Right, and that corresponds to the classical path, right? So there's we're gonna in, we're gonna assume there's some notion of h bar, and um, that the corrections to the classical path, or cr the the thickness here, is going to scale with h bar. Okay, so I'm just using this as a motivation to say there exists something called an action which is going to give us when we extremize it the classical equations of motion. Okay. So um, that, that, that's, those are just words. Uh, so, so now for the bold claim. The bold claim is that to determine the action, I only need to know uh, the symmetries of the action and the uh, symmetries of the ground state, okay, of the lowest energy state of the system. So um, that's a very bold claim. And it's not completely true. So it is not a theorem, because I can give counterexamples. But we're going to use it as a working hypothesis um, just to see how far we can get with just those assumptions. And we'll see that uh, we can get amazingly far with that true. So uh, the claim is, is that the, um, the, we can describe the action can be determined by knowing its symmetries and the symmetries of the ground state. So um, this this uh, this, this, this seems way much too broad and abstract because clearly I need to know what the degrees of freedom are. Okay, so this can't, I can't possibly know all the degrees of freedom just from knowing that. Okay, but if I'm only interested in the lowest energy degrees of freedom, then I claim that's all you need. There are exceptions to this rule. Say if I'm only interested in the gapless degrees of freedom. Okay, so th this is the caveat to the, 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 these claims. So what I mean by that is, is that a gapless, uh, uh, a gapless degree of freedom of one where the energy goes to zero when the momentum goes to zero, okay? Um, now, so as I said, um, so how can that be? And the answer is Goldstone's theorem. So Goldstone's theorem, which we all learn uh, about when we first take field theory, we usually think about in terms of internal symmetries, and we learn about Goldstone bosons. But Goldstone bosons are much more pervasive than that what we just learned about in the Ising model or 
whatever the canonical example we learned when we studied Peskin and Schroeder. Um, and I claim is that all gapless degrees of freedom are Goldstone bosons, and the, uh, that, that claim is false because I can, I can name a few counterexamples. But as a working hypothesis for what we're interested in is actually will be incredibly effective. Okay, so there are, so, um, and these, these, these uh, gapless degrees of freedom will be Goldstones. Okay, now the counterexamples that you should know, and these are just, um, Uh, are you just think off the top of your head, the one you're all familiar with, for instance, is if you just take the standard model and you make the, the fermions massless, they're not Goldstone bosons and they're gapless. So that's a counterexample. So, yeah. So not necessarily. So, um, so uh, in a non-relativistic system, so for instance, if I have a part of, if, if I have a non-relativistic system which has Galilean invariance but not Poincaré invariance, if I have a particle, it's gapless because I, it's got E equals P squared over 2M because I've gotten rid of the mass. So that's a gapless. So in a relativistic case, yes, it would be the same thing, but in a non-relativistic case, it's not. And so we'll, we'll have to, that's, there's, uh, there's uh, interesting issues that need to be discussed when we get to that point, and we'll talk about that. Um, so you, the obvious counterexample, of course, are fermions in, uh, in, in the standard model. So it's actually most of what we're, we're going to talk about will be, uh, we'll be talking about mostly non-relativistic systems um, or quasi-relativistic systems when we talk about black holes. The other counterexample, even in, there are even counterexamples in, in non-relativistic systems. So for instance, in a metal, in Landau's theory of metals, there's something called zero sound, um, which is a gapless degree of freedom that, as far as we know, is not a Goldstone boson. No one has been able to pin down uh, if it, 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 there's, I suspect that it could be a Goldstone boson, but I have not been able to figure out uh, how to make that work. So there are examples, and so I don't, you know, I don't profess that this is, you shouldn't take this as metaphysical certitude. This is, this is, this is a working hypothesis that will serve us greatly. So I'm not, I'm not claiming this is in any way a mathematical theorem or a rigorous statement. So with those caveats, let's, let's move on. Okay. So um, we need an algorithm to determine what uh, the action is. So the first thing we need to do is we need to... Um, how do we spell algorithm wrong? Is that right? That's right? I was a computer science major as an undergraduate, and it scarred me. So, um, okay. So one is uh, so we first need to determine the, the, what are the relevant degrees of freedom. And next, we need to determine um, uh, the action consistent with the symmetries. Okay, so let's. What we'll do is we'll first talk a little bit about uh, Goldstone's theorem, and maybe we'll talk about it in a way that you're perhaps not familiar with, um, and then we'll talk about given Goldstone bosons, how do we build actions for Goldstone bosons, and that's called the Cosec construction, and we will be focusing on the Cosec constructions for systems which break space-time symmetries. Um, so, you know, if I were uh, in an ideal world, I think uh, the first thing you would learn in physics is Goldstone's theorem, because it's the reason why we see what we see, right? And eventually, hopefully, after these lectures, it will open your eyes to see the Goldstone bosons which surround you at all times. So. It's an interesting idea in, in physics education is to, instead of teaching F is equal to MA, teach Goldstone's theorem as the very first thing you learn. Because you should understand why there's, why, we, why there's stuff. So, okay. Um, 
All right, so let's let's talk about uh, Goldstone's theorem. So some of this probably will be review for many of you, um, but uh, um, we need to go through it nonetheless. Okay. So uh, is this is this is the eraser. This is. <laughs> I thought it was dessert. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Goldstone's theorem. Okay. Okay, so um, generically we'll use the term G for the uh, invariance group of the, f the complete invariance group and we'll say that G will be broken down to a subgroup H. Okay, so that's w when I talked about G and H, you'll know from now on what I'm talking about. Um, and also, just to set some terminology, the generators of H will be written as uh, T, right? And uh, so these are the unbroken generators, and the broken generators are, so we'll just write as H. So these guys are unbroken. Okay? So the picture to always have in the back of your mind whenever you think of spontaneous symmetry breaking is you have, um, you know, some, the usual sort of Mexican hat potential. And for internal symmetries, this is a very good picture to have. It doesn't really work so well when it comes to space-time symmetries. But it still mathematically uh, is a good thing to always sort of have in the back of your mind. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the potential. Um, and uh, here's a, here, this is called the vacuum manifold. And uh, the physics, at any point, any choice on that manifold is identical, right? So this is the ground state, and you're free to choose any ground state that you want. And uh, the, um, the physics is, 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 is identical. Um, so the action of the group, if I say choose a point here around which to quantize, then uh, the action of G will be to push you around this basin, whereas the action of H is going to leave it invariant because H on the vacuum uh, is equal to zero, right? Because H is unbroken, or, or I should say an element of H. Maybe right, right T. Okay. Um, so, as I said, so G is going to move you around, and H just leaves you where you were before. So, um, this, uh, this space is called uh, the coset space. Uh, G mod H is the coset space. And the reason it's called the coset space is because for every element G, you can define an equivalence class of elements called the cosets, right? It can be a left or a right coset. So if given G, then I can write H, any element of H multiplying G will be in that equivalence class. So G and H1 and G and H1, H2, those are all equivalent. And why is that? Because if I operate on the vacuum with this, it's still the same as operating with G. Right? Because H leaves the vacuum inv invariant. Right? So you have a, the elements now, uh, you can form, so these, are, so these are called, this would be called the right coset, or you could do the same thing where you put the H's on the other side, that would be called the left coset. Now what's important to understand is the left, the cosets do not necessarily form a group. Okay, so this is a, in, uh, the first exercise that you can do 
is uh, show that cosets form a group, only form a group uh, if H is a normal subgroup. And I'll tell you what the definition of a normal subgroup is. So normal is defined as that conjugation leaves it in H. Okay, so there's an there's exercise you can do. We'll call that exercise number one. Okay. So um, you can see that there's a flat direction, and that flat direction corresponds to uh, the, a massless degree of freedom. So, so far we can talk about this being a relativistic system, and this is a massless degree of freedom that's living in the bottom of this band, right? Okay, so um, uh, you're, you're probably all familiar with the fact that, or the, the concept that in a relativistic system, the number of Goldstone bosons is actually equal to uh, the number of broken generators, right? So let's, let's see how that works, and then we'll see why it fails in the non-relativistic case. And that's, in some sense, why the non-relativistic case is more interesting, uh, because the physics is a little bit um, uh, less obvious. Oh, actually, before I do that, let me just say a few things about the field theory here. So, um, if, if, I, uh, if I choose a state to quantize around, then there's what's known as the super selection rule, which tells you that there's no operator that can move you from uh, one point in the manifold to another point in the manifold, okay, in the infinite volume limit. So, so uh, in V goes to infinity limit, uh, there exists a super selection rule which is the statement that, um, so if I call this uh, phi 1, O, phi 2, that's equal to 0, and O is any operator in the algebra of, this, of the theory. And this phi 1 and phi 2 are two different points along the, um, the vacuum. And so you could sort of understand, let me give you a physical reason for that. So imagine this was a spin system, right? So, um, if I have all the, so here's one manifold, uh, here's one point on the circle, here's another point on the circle, right? What I mean by that is here. So here's where all the spins are pointing this way, and here's all the spins are pointing that way, right? There's no operator that can take you from here to here if there are infinite number of spins, right? Because any, any operator, the, the rough hand-waving argument is any operator you have, there'll be some non-overlap, some number less than one, and some number less than one to the infinite power is zero, right? That's the basic reason. That's very wishy-washy uh, hand-waving explanation. So, um, so then a question which should which should you should raise is, well, wait a second. You just told me that the pion moves you around, and I just claim that you can't move around. So how do we resolve that apparent paradox? And the answer is, is that the pion moves you around locally at, a, at some region of space, it's fluctuation. So it's like a small fluctuations of the spins here can certainly change. I just can't change them everywhere at the same time. So in order to change them everywhere at the same time, I'd have to have a pion, I'm using that term now because I know you're all familiar with that, that it's a goldstone, ha of, of infinite wavelength, right? That you can do. But that's not surprising because that's, that's a zero momentum state is going to, it's not normalizable, so that's not in the, in the spectrum. So that's consistent. Everybody understand that? 
So it's okay to have a local fluctuation of the vacuum. That's the, that's the Goldstone boson, right? You just can't have a global fluctuation of the vacuum because it costs you an infinite amount to do that, okay? Okay. Yeah. No, because this one, so th because I'm defining this one as uh, in, uh, tra translationally invariant. In other words, this, this, this state is everywhere in space the spins are up. This state is everywhere in space the spins are down, right? Whereas the state with a pi on, if I hit this with a pi on, then locally I'll change it in wherever that pi of x has support. Okay, so um, so let, let's uh, let's remind ourselves so uh, of why Lorentz invariance is crucial for having a one-to-one -one correspondence between a number of broken generators and the number of Goldstone bosons. So let's go back to uh, the proof of Goldstone's theorem in the relativistic case. Okay, so, yeah. Oh, oh where is, uh, wh oh, what is the statement of Goldstone's theorem? Okay, so, I'm uh, sorry, good. So in the, rel <laughs> in the relativistic case, I'm going to state Goldstone's theorem is that there exists a massless particle uh, a that couples to the generator of a broken current. So every broken current will couple to a massless particle. And now I'm going to prove that. Okay, so um, so let me consider, uh, there are lots of ways of doing it. This is just one way. Let me consider the limit of Q goes to zero of um, Okay, so um, as I said, there are lots of different ways of doing it. This is just one way of doing it. Um, okay, so um, this and, I'm th no and JMU is a symmetry current, so the, the local conservation law is that JMU, DMU, JMU is zero. So uh, this thing acts on X. So the, uh, when it acts on this, you get zero. But since it's a time order product, it can act on the theta function. So there's a theta function which gives you the two different time orderings, right? Um, so this is equal to uh, limit Q goes to zero d4x. Okay, so it gives you the, it gives you that commutator. And the reason it gives you the commutator because there are two different time orderings. One and one case you get a negative sign, and one case you get a plus sign. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Q goes to zero. Yeah. No, Q Q is the variable I'm Fourier transforming with respect to. Yep, we're going to take Q to zero when we're done. Yep. Okay, so did everyone understand this step here? This delta, what this delta says is that um, it's only going to pick out the zero component of this guy. No, it's a Kronecker delta. It's making, it's forcing this mu to be, uh, to only pick out the zero component of that guy. Right, because you're only getting a D by DT because that's the theta function is only a function of t. And then once you pick out that t, that picks out this zero here. Okay, um, so um, this is equal to, now remember that q, 
the charge is defined as d well d d x uh, j zero of x and t. So this just becomes actually let's uh, let let's just do this integral over it just to save ourselves some trouble. D we'll do it the integral over the uh, spatial dimensions. Um, so this just becomes um, e to the i q dot x delta mu zero zero commutator of q with phi. Okay, and um, since the symmetry is broken, q does not annihilate by assumption. Q does not annihilate this va uh, this the vacuum, and just gives you this thing is not equal to zero. And it's proportionate to the variation in phi, which is known as the order parameter. Okay, so Q, remember Q generates the symmetry transformation on the field. And I've assumed here that phi carries non-trivial quantum numbers under that symmetry. Yeah? Oh, well, the most important thing, all that I really care about is that it's non-zero. So the, 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 that's why I put a proportional sign here, that it's non-zero. Because what... That's the crucial point. Yeah. Oh, because you'll see what I'm going to, I'll need the exponent for, for something else. Okay. So we've established that this thing is non-zero when the symmetry is broken. But now let's look, let's look at, uh, let's re-examine, uh, let's re-examine this expression. And this is where the Lorentz invariance is going to come into play. Okay, so uh, let me. Uh, so here I'm going to do an integration by parts. So let me call this uh, the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is equal to up to a minus sign. Okay, so all I did was an integration by parts. And one of the things I'm assuming is that the surface term vanishes. That actually is a subtlety that you have to worry about sometimes because if there are long range fields, then, then you can run into trouble. But I'm going to assume that all the fields vanish to infinity. Okay, so now this is where I'm going to use, um, this is where I'm going to use Lorentz invariance. So I'm going to claim that this thing, this object here, has to be a function it has to be a vector, f something with a vector index and is a function only of Q squared. That's Lorentz invariance. Right? Or Lorentz covariance. Okay? And uh, there and this, similarly by Lorentz covariance, has to be some Q, which is the only four vector around, times F of Q squared. Uh, I, have to, I have to go back and fix something there in a second, and you'll see, uh, you'll see why. So this thing is equal to Q squared f of q squared. Oh, because uh, this thing is on it's only a function of q. I could have skipped this step if it would make if it would make if it make you feel better. This thing uh so this thing has to be that. There's no choice by Lorentz invariance. Okay? Uh so let me go back here. so let me come back here and fix something because so when we replace this j by a q, we had to take the q to zero here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the, the otherwise. So this, this shouldn't be there. And I already took q to zero, right? Because in order to do this integral here, I can't have the e to the i q. So that's why I had to take q to zero. 
right? So, you, so wh you're asking why did I take Q to zero? Okay, so uh, maybe, if, maybe let me finish and then we'll come back because maybe once you see this, then it'll make sense to you. So now we're gonna we're gonna t now we still have to take Q to zero, right? And this can't th we've just showed that that is not equal to zero. So therefore, f of Q squared has to have a pole when Q squared goes to zero. Okay. What is F? It's what it's this it's this thing here. Right? So here let me rewrite it. Let me be a little bit more pedantic. Hold on. So this is what I'm gonna say. So let me let me explain the logic. So um uh D D X E to the I Q dot X T j mu of x phi of zero, okay? I claim on general grounds, just by Lorentz invariance, right, that this thing has to be equal to q mu f of q squared. I don't, I'm not claiming I know what f is at this point, okay? So now if I, so that, that's this piece here. Now if I dot into, so q mu, if I dot into it, right, Okay, is that good? Happy? You don't look happy. Okay, and then I'm taking, now remember we're taking the limit where Q goes to zero, and that implies that F of Q squared has a pole. Because this is not equal to zero in this limit. And how is that not equal to zero? We proved it over here. That's why I didn't care what the coefficients were. Yeah. Can you these Say again. Can can this be divergent? Can this expectation value? Yes. No, it should take on a finite value because the, the, this. So. Uh, why? Oh, because, it, uh, let's see, are you asking whether or not this order param Certainly, a renormalized expectation value is finite in any sensible theory, right? <laughs> okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a delta, f there's a delta function in T. Yeah, so, the, I mean, if I left the T integral here, then it would have... Yeah. Right. But it go the T goes along for the ride, yeah. Okay, so the most important part of this exercise, so I, I, I would recommend if you didn't understand this that you go through it uh, yourself, uh, try to reproduce it. Uh, but the most important part of this exercise is to understand this step because this step shows you the rest doesn't follow unless you use Lorentz invariance, okay? So now, so now, so what this shows is that for every current, there's a Goldstone boson. Every current which generates a broken symmetry, there's a Goldstone boson, right? So the question is, what happens in the non-relativistic case when we don't have Lorentz invariance anymore, okay? So now, uh, let's look at the non-relativistic case. So um, in the non-relativistic case, we'll be able to show, let me just tell you what the answer is, that there exists, see the, 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 the power of 
of relativity is that it told you it had this 1 over q squared pole. So that's a well-defined notion of a particle. That's how we define a particle. But we'll see in the non-relativistic case, it's still true that there have to be gapless states, but they don't necessarily have to be particles. Okay, and I'll explain what I mean. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Okay. So uh, let's consider the non-relativistic case, and let's see what the implications are. So we're going to start by assuming that we have some uh, generator Q, which does not annihilate the vacuum. Uh, and so we're going to say that this thing is not equal to zero. So that's our bare assumption. And let's see what we can conclude from that. So um, let's write this out. And I'm going to insert a complete set of states. And I'm going to put this guy at zero. So this, this field is sitting at zero. Okay, so um, what can we learn from this? Um, well, first, let me shift by translational invariance. So assuming translational invariance, I can shift I can shift this current away from the origin, I mean to the origin, I should say. Okay? And this is not equal to zero. Everybody follow that? Right? So the only assumption I made here is translational invariance and that the uh, the um, the the order parameters takes on a non zero expectation value. So now I can do the integral over x, right? So this gives me And this whole thing has to not be equal to zero. Okay?
So um, let's see, what, is it, what exactly does this mean? Well, um, when, uh, so this is telling us in both cases that uh, the, we're looking at a zero momentum state, right? And um, the claim is, is that this implies that there must exist a state with e equal to zero when p goes to zero. Okay? Um, right. So, Um, because it has to be true, it has to be true for all t, right? And the only way it can be true for all t is if there's a state when e is equal to zero. Yeah. Say again. Right. So at this point, I'm assuming that I have some form of translational invariance. So that's it's right. So if you don't, actually, that's an interesting question. We'll come back to that when we talk about the theory of solids. That's a good question. So, but uh, we're not ready for it yet. Okay, so, but notice that it tells you that there's a state with zero energy and zero momentum, but it doesn't tell you anything about the state. It doesn't tell you whether or not it's, what is its width? It's, it could be so broad. It could be anything, right? So it doesn't really tell you anything about whether or not there is a particle. So what is the definition of a particle? And usually we define a particle, or a, sometimes a quasi-particle, one where the width um, is much, much less than the energy in the limit when the energy goes to zero. Right? That's a sensible definition of a particle. That's how people in solid-state physics define a, par a quasi-particle. So we have no idea whether or not there really is a particle corresponding to that Goldstone boson. Okay? So this is really interesting because it's telling us that we don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between particles and Goldstone bosons, between broken symmetries and Goldstone particles anymore. Okay? And so uh, th for those of you who've thought a little bit about solid-state physics, let's consider uh, a metal. Okay? So a metal has a lattice. And the lattice breaks all sorts of symmetries. It breaks boost invariance, it breaks rotational invariance, it breaks translational invariance, okay? But does anyone know, what are the, are there Goldstone bosons in a solid? Right, phonons. There are three phonons in a solid. But how many symmetries did we break? Well, we broke th three translations, three boosts, and three rotations, nine. We lost six Goldstone bosons somewhere in the fray. Okay, so we have to understand how do we do bolt. So remember, our first aim was to figure out what the gold, what are the degrees of freedom in the system. We need to know what the Goldstone bosons are, but if we don't know how to count them, then how can we possibly know how to write down an action? So clearly, we need to deepen our understanding of how, of how Goldstone bosons appear. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, so if you want, so if it's, if you take, t this has to be true for all t, right? right? 
So I don't see how you could get it otherwise. So, right. So also, so I mean, the the um, the the t dependence between these. T so there's two things going on here. One is that it's non-zero, and then it's independent of t. Those are the two crucial statements. And the only way for it to be independent of t is if there's that state when p goes to zero, when e goes to zero. That's really the crucial statement, not as much that it's non-zero. It has to be non-zero as a starting point, but the crucial point is it, had to be in it has to be independent of time. Okay. So let, let's try to understand... So our next goal will be to try to understand um, a little bit better about what, hap what happens to the Goldstone bosons that should be there. And when we do that, that will... Um, That will elucidate how uh, we uh, write down an action. So we'll learn two things at the same time. One is we'll learn what the correct Goldstone bosons are, and the other is we'll learn how to write down an action for those Goldstone bosons. I think I may, since I went off script, I may have passed over some exercises. Hold on. I wouldn't want to miss out on any exercises. No, okay. So, in order to figure out what happened to the Goldstone bosons, let's first figure out how we would um, write down an action for a general Goldstone boson in the first place. And then once we do that, we'll understand better what happened to, uh, what happens to all the missing Goldstone bosons. Okay. So let's go back to our picture here that we should always have in the back of our minds uh, of this vacuum manifold. And we said that the Goldstone bosons are, um, can be thought of as like localized group actions on the manifold. So it makes sense uh, if we're talking about some fluctuation. Let me define e to the i uh, x dotted into pi uh, as an exponential parameterization. So remember, the, so this x here are the broken generators, and these are the pions associated with those broken generators, the goldstones. So for now, let's just assume there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. We'll see what happens, how that, uh, how that necessarily fails in the non-relativistic case. So the action of U on the uh, ground state um, is like a localized action of G on the ground state, right? So G, remember, <coughs> moves you around, but remember, a pion is this is only locally, right? So you have a local fluctuation, and this U acting on the ground state is going to give you a local change in the order parameter, right? Because this U, this thing, remember that this is an element of G. It's an X-dependent element of G, right? So uh, it makes sense for this to be the fundamental object which we use to, uh, to, um, to calculate, to write down an action for our theory. Okay? Now, U has uh, uh, interesting properties itself under a G transformation. So if we act, so if we consider G, little g, is an element of big G, then g on u, so let me write this as u of pi. Well, what is the action of g on u? And in the back of your mind, what you should think of, what is the action on the manifold? In other words, this g 
is going to move you around. This U is going to move you around. So this should be another element of U with a different pi. We'll call it pi prime. Up to an arbitrary element of H. And that element will depend on the original value of pi and the choice of G. Why is there that arbitrary H afterwards? Because remember, H does nothing when acting on the vacuum. It just, it just, the identity. So you can't, acting on this space, you can't tell the difference between u of pi prime and eight, u of pi prime times h, right? So this, this is uh, a crucial formula which we'll be using a lot, okay? And um, what we're gonna learn from it is how uh, the pions transform under G and how the pions transform under H. Again, using the term pion generically to mean a Goldstone boson. So um, the claim is, is that, um, so under H, pi's transform linearly That is, under H, pi goes to some linear operator times pi. And under G, pi transforms nonlinearly, which means it doesn't transform that way. Usually, it involves some inhomogeneous shift. So for instance, pi goes to pi plus A, that would be a, a nonlinear transformation. Linear transformation should be proportional to itself, right? And that, that's not. So I'm just giving you, there, there's actually, you'll see that the, the very complicated transformation of pi, but I'm giving you just the most basic one, okay? So um, as an exercise, uh, show that Um, show that this is true, where this is this one. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of information so you can do this problem. So I want you to show that under, under H, pi transforms uh, linearly. So in order to do that, you need, we need a little bit of uh, information. So remember that, uh, that a T, T forms a subgroup. So a T, commutator a T with a T gives you a T, right? Now the question is, um, um, what does a T and an X give you? And I claim that you can prove that a T and an X um, have to give you back a T. And that follows from the fact that um, it's not always true. It is true... Um, for a compact Lie group. Um, I th this is exercise number uh, a T, right, so this is exercise number two. And I think I misspoke. This, this has to be an X, not a T. And the way to see this is to note that, so for a compact Lie group, so a compact Lie group are all basically, uh, so the usual internal symmetries, SUN, SON, those are all compact groups. Uh, so for a compact Lie group, you can always choose a basis where, uh, can always choose a basis where the structure constants are totally anti-symmetric.
okay? Which is to say, so remember what the structure constants, so for instance, uh, T i, T j is i, f, i, j, k, T k. That's what I, that's what I mean by the structure constants. So, um, so using this, we can use the fact that there can't be a T on the right-hand side because if there were a T on the right-hand side, I could use this anti-symmetry and that would contradict this statement. So I'm going to let you actually figure that out for yourself. Okay, it takes, just it takes t a few seconds of thought. But that's, as part of the exercise, show that this is true. So this statement follows from here. Okay? So think about this. And then, once you know that this is true, then you'll be able to show this. Okay? And the way you'll show that is by performing a, uh, um, an H transformation on U and using the exponential form of H. Right? An element of H goes like E to the IT. And then you know what U has the X's upstairs. And then if you do a little bit of algebra, you'll, you'll see it. Okay? Okay. Um, so there's a pr this is clearly a preferred basis to work with, right? But once you prove it in a basis, then you're then you're done, right? Right. Right. It's just that it's obvious in this basis. It would be much more complicated in another basis. To prove it, it's easy to prove it in this basis that transforms linearly. If you went to another basis, it would be harder. But you still, it still has to transform linearly in any basis. Okay. So now, uh, so now uh, let's keep this magic formula there because that we're going to use that. And now uh, we're going to use. Uh, this is where the, the, the famous paper by uh, Callan, Coleman, West, and Zumino comes in. So one thing to notice is that you should keep in the back of your mind is, so are space-time symmetries compact Lie groups? No, no they're not. So some, again, when we break space-time symmetries, things are going to get more interesting. But we first have to do the simple case before we can do the complicated case. Okay, so um, so this uh, this is the famous result of CCWZ, Callan, Coleman, West, and Zumino, who did it first for pions in the 1960s. So we're not quite up to speed yet, but we have to take baby steps before we can take giant leaps. So um, the first thing you do is you define what's known as the Moore-Carton form, which is a fancy word for this object, um, and thing is, so this is the Mora Carton form. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a Lie algebra valued one form. That's, the, that's what it's usually said. But, but what you can really just see is this thing is an element of the, this, this thing, it takes on values in the Lie algebra. Right? Because you exponentiate it, right? It brings down the generator. Okay, so we can then uh, decompose it as follows. So we can write this as T A uh, A A mu plus X A uh, D um, mu pi. D A mu pi. Okay, so this is just a definition. This is nothing yet. That's not. That has no content, right? The only content is that it's a linear combination of of the, it, it, it's va it takes on values in the Lie algebra. Remember, T and the Lie algebra of big G is the union of T and X, right? These A's. This a and this d pi are going to be some functions of the pion fields. 
Okay. Now the claim is um, that that under a G transformation. Okay, so, so far the problems I've given you, I hope you'll find easy. And I will, uh, so this one takes a little bit more thought, isn't, uh, and I will, and if you get stuck on it, I will, uh, if, if the, if Duff doesn't show you how to do it, I'll post a solution for you. Um, so under a G transformation, something miraculous happens. So XA D mu pi A goes to h of pi and g d a x a mu h minus one of pi and g. So why is that miraculous? So under g, this thing transforms like it's under h. This looks like an h transformation. So, so we're going to call this a covariant derivative because under a G, it transforms covariantly under H, right? Which seems kind of miraculous, okay? And if just, does anyone want to make a guess how this thing transforms? The clue is it's written as A mu. So what, what, what do we usually associate with A mu? Which is a gauge, gauge field. And how does the gauge field transform? When it, well, that's true, but it also shifts, right? So T A A A mu goes to H. And I'm not going to write the argument again because it's not good use of time. transforms like a gauge field, which is great because, w so this, this is the whole key to the COSAC construction. This is the brilliance of the CCW paper. Why? Because, look, the pions transform really complicated in some way under G, but they transform really simply under H, right? If I take these objects, if I know what these objects are, which I can read off by calculating this, then I can form G invariance, which is what we want. We want a Lagrangian, which is G invariant. How do I form G invariance? Easy. I form H invariance. Because anything which is invariant under H is automatically invariant under G. Okay? That's the brilliance of CCWZ. So, uh, so if you think about it, so what are we trying to do? Let's just sort of get, get a big picture of what's going on here. We're trying to write down an action for the pions that's invariant under G. So the important thing to remember, you know, when we first learned spontaneous symmetry breaking, I, uh, we're often misled into thinking that somehow the symmetry is no longer invariant, the, the action's no longer invariant, right? It's totally invariant. Because remember that the, the, the action doesn't, you know, the, the, uh, the currents which generate the transformations are local objects. They don't know anything about the vacuum. They don't care what the vacuum is. So if I have a bunch of currents that obey some symmetry algebra, they obey it no matter what the vacuum is, right? What's complicated about a spontaneously broken theory is that the pions transform non-linearly under G. And we'll see how they transform. It's very complicated, right? So how am I possibly going to form an... In now, it's really easy to write down an invariant action when things transform linearly, right? You just form inner products. Right? If I have two vectors, they transform linearly, I can form an invariant just by taking the inner product. But if I have some really complicated transformation law, forget about it. You're going to sit there all day and play with it until you get something which is invariant. But we're going to be able to write down something exactly invariant without doing much work because of this. Right? So this, this is exercise three. That uh, that under that pions. Uh, so here. 
So here, this, this is pretty much an empty statement at this point. Because I haven't told you what this is. No, 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 no. So, so you're, you're thinking one step ahead. Pretend I didn't call this D, but I just called it Tom. Right? Then you wouldn't think that, right? It will turn out that sometimes, what, so, so pions are not always shift invariant. So one of the things I hope to teach you before, before the end of this, before this is over, is that a lot of things that you learned are not necessarily always correct. So for instance, you are, usually learn that pions are already always derivatively coupled. You probably all learned that, right? That's not true. And once you base, break space-time symmetry, that is not a correct statement. So usually the uh, pions are phenomenologically, or I say goldstones are usually phenomenologically not so interesting because it long, they couple derivatively. They couple proportional to their momentum. So they can't lead to any long-range forces, right? Because as the distance between the particles goes, gets big, the exchange Q gets small and the force goes to zero. So they can't lead to like 1 over R, 1 over R squared force laws. But when space-time symmetries are broken, that's no longer true. Okay, so um, we will talk about that. Yeah. Question. So, it's so this this uh, maybe the right way to say it is this, this object has a color index. And then yeah. This row. Yeah. This row. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, the pion should the pion should be here. So this 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 guy should be here. And I should write it in the same way as I did it here. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so how do you figure out what these things are? And the answer is direct calculation. You take the exponents, right? You take the derivatives, and we're going to do this ad, ad nauseum probably tomorrow. You bring things down, you commute them, you pick off the coefficient of this, you call that A. You pick off the coefficient of this, you call that d mu pi. But once we have d mu pi and a, I can form an action, right? So I need, so how do we form an action? So uh, given d mu pi and a, so given d mu pi and a, we can form an in, a g invariant action. by forming an H invariant action. Oh, exercise three is to prove this. So this is, this is the tough one. That's, this one takes a little bit of work. So this is more challenging than the other ones, I, I hope. Um, I don't know. I mean, I realize also that probably everyone here, there are people at different stages of their education. So some things which are challenging for some. I don't want those who find the other ones challenging to get discouraged, right? People are at different stages of their education. So everyone should, one of the first things you learn is not to compare yourself to other people, right? Because then we would all think about Witten and we would quit. <laughs> so <laughs> if I had time, I'd tell you a funny story about that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, um, so we need some rules to um, form the action. So, I mean, I can, in principle, form, um, uh, an arbitrarily complicated function of these, of d mu, let's, let's ignore a mu for the, m for the moment, we'll come back to it later, yeah.
Mm -hmm. So is you, right, right. So your question is, how do I prove that 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 I've constructed all the invariants? Is that your question? So, so, um, I'm not, so this this statement is as general as, you, as it possibly can be. Yeah. An object, yeah. I don't know if there's a mathematical proof. I, I, I don't, I've never seen it discussed that there's a proof. Um, I know of no examples where it doesn't capture everything. So, yeah. <sighs> okay. Okay, so how do we write down an action? We need some rules to write down an action. So, um, so I, I haven't told you the complete truth. So I wanted to claim that in radical effective field theoryism, all you need is the symmetries and the broken symmetries, and you can write down everything. But there's one other piece of in, one other assumption you need, and that is locality. Okay. Okay. So the definition of locality uh, depends on who you talk to. Okay, so some people say locality is equivalent to microcausality. So microcausality is a statement that um, that given two operators, if they're space-like, or if they're space-like separated, then they have to commute. That's microcausality. And by the way, for those of you who uh, are interested in issues of black hole evaporation and, and such things, the reason with gravity, the question is, is gravity local, is because there are no local observables in gravity. So this, this question becomes ambiguous. So that's why gravity is different when it comes to field theories and what is the meaning of locality. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, th so microcausality. Sometimes people equate it with locality. So I will let leave that up to you. So I I, I have my own definition. No, I'm so what I'm trying to do is not bias you into thinking like I do. Okay. So I'm telling you what other people, the way I think about locality is that, um, so the action, there are two ways to think about it. One, so, so one is the action, uh, has a, the action has a finite number of derivative couplings. And the way to think about this is to think about a lattice. So if we were to take all the degrees of freedom and put them on a lattice. Remember, derivatives correspond to differences between nearest neighbors. And as you increase the number of derivatives, you have more and more couplings between nearest neighbors. So if you had interactions with an infinite number of derivatives and you kept and you treated it as part of your action, that would couple everything, all the points instantaneously with each other. So you can see why that is kind of makes sense that it's the same thing as this. Right, so I mean, it's not that I have anything against this way of thinking about it, but uh, it doesn't help me when I think about building actions. So that's why I think about it like this. Uh, I think so. If you turn, if we are, are we talking about, are we going to allow for gravity, or we're not going to allow for gravity? That's the that's the crucial. If you don't allow, if you allow for gravity, if you don't allow for gravity, then anything which is I, which is which obeys microcausality should be local, but I don't know of a proof of that by this definition of local. But physically, it makes I'd be shocked if that weren't true. I don't know of any non-perturbative proof. I think you can prove in perturbation theory. Okay, so an equivalent way or equivalently uh, 
is, is that it should have a well-defined derivative expansion. And I think actually, uh, in the back of my mind, this is what I always think of. That is, if you Fourier transform your action, it should be well-defined when Q goes, when the momentum goes to zero. You shouldn't have things like uh, log of Q squared. You could have Q squared log of Q squared, but or you can have one over Q squared, right? So another way of saying that should be polynomial in the momentum, right? So, um, um, it's just, this just means you have a well-defined derivative expansion. Uh, mathematically, it, you could also say that it's analytic around Q equals zero, right? You can expand around Q equals zero. Why is that important? This is crucial because if you did not have locality, you would have no predictive power. There would not be science if we did not have locality. This is my claim. So why is that true? So I claim no locality, no science. <laughs> so this is all part, part of radical effective field theoryism. So no locality, no science. So um, why is that? Well, so uh, let's look at our let's look at our Lagrangian that we're going to build for cosine. Well, I don't think gravity is going to cure your problems, right? So uh, in other words, if you've got a pro if you've got a problem with uh, quantum mechanics or basic field theory, I don't think gravity can come in and save you. So I would say yes. What's that? So. Yes, excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. So the question is, why doesn't the non-locality and gravity ruin its predictive power? That's a, a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. So let me, exp but before I, before I admit my ignorance, let me tell you something I do know. Okay, so, um, so suppose we allowed for, so let, we allowed for arbitrary uh, derivatives, right? And, with, and it doesn't have to be polynomial. Okay, well, um, so then I could write down, um, so let, let, let me just start, you know, I can write something down like, I'm, I'm not worried about the cosine, now let's just push that, let, not worried about Goldstone bosons, now I'm just worried about locality, okay? I have some field theory, and I can write down this field theory, it could be, and then it could be po some polynomial in the fields, and then I could have higher derivatives, you know, to the n, and I you know, put a one half here, so forth and so on. Okay. Now, uh, you know, so you guys are young enough, so you didn't learn this. But when I was your age, I was taught that field theories had to be renormalizable. Do you guys know what renormalizable is? And s in fact, it's still in lots of textbooks, right? That you can only write down theories with operators up to dimension four, because if you don't, you generate divergences and of higher dimensions, and then you don't know what to do with them, so you just throw it away. So in the old days, they would just throw things away. But nowadays, we know that's just, that's just nonsense, right? So, um, uh, so I start to, what I start to do is, the general idea is I write down everything that's consistent with the symmetries, right? And then, well, there's an infinite number of things which are consistent with the symmetries, Right? I could write, I could write this down, you know, an infinite sum with arbitrary powers of this guy right here. And remember, there's unknown coefficients in front of each one of them. Right? So if I don't have some way of truncating this series, I have no predictive power. Right? Why is that? Because I have to perform an experiment in order to extract these coefficients. When you, this is the whole point of renormalization, right? When you first learn renormalization, you get very confused because the mass diverges, right? And it doesn't make any sense at all, right? But then you realize, well, I didn't know what the mass was anyway, right? So who cares if it diverges? I have to measure it, right? So this whole hang-up with renormalization is just some, is, is a misconception, right? You should be thinking, who cares if it diverges? I have to measure it anyway, 
right? And however it gets finite, it gets finite. So um, this, this is also, so, you know, you often hear uh, people say, well, quantum gravity is irrelevant. It's not irrelevant, right? Because quantum gravity contributes to the mass of the electron, right? So empirically, it's irrelevant because I don't know the mass of the electron, but I got to measure it. But it's not true that loops, graviton loops, don't contribute substantially to the mass of the electron, right? It does. It's just, a, it's just, it's just meaningless from a, a, it's a, it's more of a philosophical question, right? Because physically, you know, you could have anything contribute to the mass of the electron at short distances. There could be a theory of cheese, right? We wouldn't know any difference. And you still would call that part of the cheese just the mass of the electron, right? But it, if the world were really string theoretic, then it is true that string loops contribute to the mass of the electron at order one, not suppressed by M Planck, at order one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why can't we assume that uh, those coefficients between uh, near infinite series of uh, derivatives they could be uh, dependent on each other, and we can uh, limit this. I mean, we can use them as three coefficients, but uh, they can form a complicated expression to M. So you could think, oh, well, I could just re if there were some coefficients here, they, I could resum them all. But take whatever you resummed and square it. I could add that to the Lagrangian too. And then I could take that and cube it. I could add that to the Lagrangian too. So no matter what you do, there's no way out. Right? So why is there no science? Because if you don't have a well-defined derivative expansion, which tells you to truncate the series as you get to more derivatives, then you've got an infinite number of coefficients and you can't, you have no predictive power. You, you could never learn anything, right? And so this is intimately tied up with the fact that um, the, the, the short distance physics goes into, the unknown short distance physics goes into these Cs, right? If that were not true, then you would need to know quantum gravity before you could predict how a block slides down a plane, right? Because when a block slides down a plane, all we need to know is the mass, right? That's all we need to know. There's one parameter, but the block is composed of an incredibly complicated system of equations, right? Of underlying degrees of freedom. Well, why don't we have to care about those underlying degrees of freedom? Why don't I need to know quantum mechanics to calculate a block sliding down a plane? How did, you know, how did Newton happen, you know, he got a law which was incredibly simple, but if he actually knew what was going on inside the block, he probably would have got very, very confused, right? But miraculously, no matter what happens inside the block, you still only need one number. And that's because all the short distance physics gets wrapped up into one number, okay? So, um, and that is all a consequence of locality, right? That's all the consequences of locality. Would not be true if the theory were not local. So we have to define, we have to, any effective field theory must be, have some power counting scheme. which allows us to truncate the action. With a well-defined error, that's crucial. So with a well-defined notion of a theoretical error, Okay, and so I put theory error in quotes because it's kind of a fudge, fudgy, fudgeable concept. What exactly is the meaning of a theory error? But let's talk about, in the simplest case, let's talk about what our power counting scheme would be in the COSEC construction. Well, dimensional analysis tells us if we have an operator, so let's say we're working in D, d, d space, working in D space, space time dimensions.
Actually, let's 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 work in four for the moment, just because we're all familiar with it. Then we know that, for instance, if we have a scalar field, uh, it has the units of mass, right? So I, if I have an operator, and we know that the action has to be scaleless, it, uh, dimensionless, I'm working in the units where uh, h bar is equal to c equal to one. Okay, and so in which case the units of s is zero. So if I have an operator which has uh, dimension, uh, let's call it uh, d, right? Then uh, it has to have a coefficient, let's call it c sub o, such that the 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 combination of c sub o and o d four x uh, is zero, right? So x has units of minus four in mass dimensions, right? So um, this this is going to have to be um, uh, 4 minus d. Okay? So as d gets larger, c has units of more and more units of 1 over some mass scale. We don't know what that mass scale is. Okay? So what is that mass scale? Well, what's the only mass scale in our COSAC construction, which has been implicit, but we haven't made... What, what's the only scale in that theory? The moment, 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 uh, what's the, uh, yes, that's correct. But what's the only constant mass scale? Order parameter. The, the symmetry breaking scale, like the Higgs VEV, right? So, um, that means that if we have a operator of dimension D, so L is going to be some sum of CI uh, let's call that order parameter lambda uh, O, and this has unit. This is d minus uh, four, right? C i o i. Does that make sense? So as I go to higher and higher dimensions, I get more powers of lambda. Okay. So lambda is so lambda. Is the uh, is the symmetry breaking scale, okay? And um, um, so sometimes people call it the cutoff. So a common uh, a, a misconception is that this is somehow related to the regulator, the cutoff regulator. It's not. So the cutoff has two meanings. One, it can mean a regulator, but usually in this context, what it really means is the scale at which the theory breaks down. Because when the momenta, so how do these operator, these O's scale? They're going to scale with momenta. So let's figure out how an O scales. We've gone over, I'm sorry. And then we'll stop. Yeah. So in it, it yes, so that's in in a chiral perturbation theory when you do pions, it's four pi f pi. But how you define I mean I have how you define f pi depends on what matrix element you choose. So the four pi I mean the symmetry breaking the quote unquote symmetry breaking scale is a little bit uh ambiguous. But if you were to do just a normal, let's say, you know, S O N model broken down to son minus one, then it's just going to be the expectation value of the field, right? F pi is that case a little bit more complicated because it's, you know, you have a condensation of quarks and um, you have to define it. You, there's, you can't, uh, you can't directly measure, you know, the expectation value of psi bar psi. So you have to do a little bit of work to get it. There is, there is, there's something called naive dimensional analysis, which allows you to count powers of four pi, but um, I don't think that's uh, be worth the time to go into. Okay, so how does O scale? So O, so remember, so D mu, we're going to say scales like Q, and we're going to assume the Q is much, much less than lambda, 
Okay, that better be true, otherwise you can't truncate the 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 uh, the Lagrangian, right? So how does phi scale? Well, uh, we can use the equal time commutation relations. Okay, so. Um, this delta x scales like 1 over x cubed, right? So this scales like uh, q cubed. Everybody follow that? Because 1 over x scales like q. Uh, on this side, we have uh, the scaling of twice the scaling of the field plus the scaling of the, um, of the momentum of the energy, d by dt gives an energy, and this has to be equal to three, right, q cubed. Right? So uh, we then conclude that phi uh, must scale as one, i.e. phi scales as q. So given any operator, uh, this, this is a particularly simple example of an effective field theory, the power counting is really simple. There's only one scale, that's a symmetry breaking scale. The field and the momentum both scale in the same way. So given any operator, I know how to read off how many powers of Q and how many powers of lambda. And if someone says, uh, make a prediction for Goldstone uh, scattering up to corrections of order, let's say I'm doing you know, uh, E over lambda to the fourth, then I would include in my action everything up to E the, up to one over lambda cubed. I'd calculate it and I'd give it to the experimentalist and I'd say, here's my results, and the errors are of order e over lambda to the fourth. But that's why, it's, that's why theory error is fungible, because it's of order e over lambda to the fourth, and when it really depends is on a value of a coefficient, which sits in front of an operator, which I've dropped, and no one promises you that it's going to be order one. Right? There are cases in effective field theory where there are anomalously large coefficients. Usually there's a good reason for that, uh, but that's sort of an art form and it varies from case to case. But in most cases, it works extremely well. Okay, so, um, so just to recap, um, so what we learned is that uh, uh, we can find out what the, go uh, the gapless modes are in a the theory, what the relevant low energy degrees of freedom are by looking at the symmetry breaking. We've learned that in Lorentz invariant theories, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the symmetry breaking uh, generators and the number of Goldstone bosons. We've learned in a non-relativistic theory that is not true, right? Then we've learned how to write down a G invariant action for Goldstones using the coset construction, okay? So tomorrow we will talk about breaking space-time symmetries, and then uh, we will derive the famous uh, action for a point particle one half mv squared. Okay, and then uh, then we'll do some more advanced stuff, and then we'll move on to black holes. <laughs>